What's up, guys? Uh, this is James with Coalition. We are back with the Four Lifters by Lifters podcast. Um, we are adding a co-host, uh, my friend Ryan the Tambear Prosciutto Poppy Barletto. Put that on the record. He said friend. Eh, ex- Note em- that. Ex-employee, however you want to call it. Yeah, uh, you know. um, either way, uh, Ryan's going to be joining me uh, for our list of guests in the upcoming episodes. Um and as like an introduction, we just want to do an episode with just the two of us. Um, you know, we've known each other for well, like seven years, eight years. I'd say it's eight or nine. Yeah, it can't be nine. We'll call it eight. We can. We're getting older. <laughs> um, but Ryan is uh, Ryan's a slightly above average powerlifter uh, who has bench 600 pounds raw but he only did it one time so it kind of counts kind of doesn't count would have been uh, twice but uh well he, a little high on the number he got a little scared of the weight so that's why he didn't I wanted get it to ease that's up. a conversation for for later okay. maybe um but you know aside from that i i think ryan and i kind of uh have similar backgrounds where powerlifting was kind of an afterthought to lifting and uh you know you kind of get lost in the sauce so to speak and uh and, you know, it just kind of turns into a competitive hobby, right? It is a competitive hobby. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's not paying your bills, it's right? Not very lucrative. Actually, what's your Unless bench you're press? Larry Wheels. Well, but even that, the powerlifting aspect's not, like, lucrative for him. No. It, it's, it can't like, get sp- – it doesn't have the sponsorships. Yeah, him being strong helps, but, like, him, like, freaking out every time he deadlifts and then, like, flexing and screaming – like if, if he if he did his numbers but wasn't jacked, nobody would care. Yeah, you gotta have the physique. Yeah, you're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Uh, I think you said it once. You're like that. Um, you can't get the sponsorships for powerlifting. Yeah, I mean that might come around, um, you know, over time. But I think as of right now, I just you know if if you look at who's paying the biggest amount of money for sponsorships, like you have like clothing companies and supplement companies but like what supplement company wants to sponsor somebody who's significantly overweight right because what are you gonna say this fat burner is great (laughs) like i think yeah if you're still fat i mean it's not a good advertisement but with the way deadlifts deadlifting has been going you got a lot of 200 pound guys yeah nice physiques yeah but a lot of a lot of the deadlifters don't even look like they lift in a t-shirt so then you have that problem um you know, and then you have like the clothing companies, but like if you're not fit and you don't look good, you're not gonna look right in the in the clothing either. So yeah. I, I just think that in general, the the average powerlifter is just difficult to market, which yeah. why the which is why the money's not there yet. But then you have guys like Russ Swoll, who look like they could step on stage. Yes. They compete in natural powerlifting, which is every well tested powerlifting, um, you know, which is every sponsor's you know, dream, right? Because then they can say that the supplements are doing more and that it's mm-hmm. not enhancements that, you know, the reason why they, yeah. you know, squat 700 pounds, but it's, you know, the supplements, the diet, the training, and this is what we can do with a natural competitor, yeah. right? So it's, it, you know, th- that's where I think things it's are a, headed. It's a safe bet, betting on a natural lifter, right? Yeah, and I, I think you also have less ups and downs, less injuries, you know, less stuff sure. like that to deal with. But which that's a whole nother thing, the sponsoring a untested athlete. What sponsors don't want to sponsor steroids. I mean, it's not a good look. I mean, look at that's why I I think it's like there's no there's no big name sponsors in powerlifting. Uh, Prime example or comparison is CrossFit. CrossFit is tested around all around. You can't be on steroids. Who's in CrossFit? Nike, Reebok, big names. You go to something like bodybuilding, Nike and Reebok aren't in it, but... I see. You're talking bigger scale sponsorships. Right. That's the money. So, I mean, a while ago, they were trying to get the IPF into the Olympics, mm. and I think that there's still a chance that powerlifting could go into the Olympics one day. Um, well, they just I, took weightlifting out. Yeah. I mean, things change, though, right? Okay. So, as yeah. momentum increases in certain sports, you know, they may reevaluate it and add... Mm-hmm you know, subtract their different things. But I think, uh, yeah, I, the, the thing about CrossFit is you're so dynamic of an athlete, right? And that is admirable to most people, yeah. right? So, like, as as much as we love, like, Big Ray, 
you know, that we have on the shaker bottles here. I don't think Big Ray's running like a good mile time. No. Or two mile time. I don't think he's doing a – he might do a muscle-up. I've, I've seen the videos of him doing uh, like 10 pull-ups, so he might do a muscle-up. But Yeah. He, he, I mean, he made it to ESPN, though, with his squat. He did. But I hear what you're saying. Yeah. And uh, um, it's – yeah, you're right. I don't even know where we, how we got started on this, but well, I, we're just going with the flow here. And I, I, um, I agree. It's like people – you know, and I, I always say this when I'm in the gym. It's like – who really cares what you lift as long as you, as, you, as you look good? You know what I mean? Yeah, but you do. I do. Yeah. Right. But, like, it's such a small group. Like, when I go to, like, a normal – when I when you go out, you know what I mean? No one's, no one's like, oh, what do you lift? They're all just, like – they pick out the guys that, like, look huge. Yeah, well, I mean, but you, you're, also, you're a big dude that also right. lifts a lot. I mean, when, when we first met – there was guys coming in the store every day. Oh, my, my buddy, you know, he benches 500. He benches yeah. 500 pounds. So I was like, is your, is your buddy Ryan? Oh, oh, you know him? You know Ryan? You know, you're, you're like a little Levittown legend. Right. It, it's, it's such a small <laughs> scale. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm, it's, um, uh, I don't know. I think it's a lot of reasons why. But I don't even, how did we get here? Uh, about this. Anyways, <laughs> I think in order for powerlifting to draw money, yes. I, I just think it ha- would end up having to be more dynamic of a sport, which means it would probably have to include other movements that would show power, which means welcome to strongman. I was just going right? to say that. Yeah, so like, there it, you go. It, there's yeah. just really no place for it realistically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but let's let's backtrack a little bit here. <laughs> um, where you started weightlifting at how so I started in the gym um, with my dad at the age of 14. Okay. Before high school football. He so you weren't even playing gym. football yet? I was. I was playing like CYO ball. Just so out of curiosity, what position were you? I was a center. Okay. And nose, t- nose guard. Yeah. Surprised you weren't mi- a running back? No. I wanted to be though. <laughs> they would never let me run the ball. So I just stayed on the line. Uh. Okay, so you started lifting at 14. And the reason why I ask that is, like, when you look at uh, at least people that I know that started lifting at a young age, their developmental, uh, I guess, like, curve is just so much stronger than somebody who starts lifting in their 20s, right? Is like a lot of guys start lifting when they when they go to college. Uh, so you're looking at, like, the 18 to 22 range. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I just feel like, you know, it's never too late, but I just feel like that's too late. Right. So when you look at a good example is, um, you know, one of our ambassadors, uh, Colton, mm-hmm. uh, I remember him coming into my store with his dad and his brother when he was 13 years old and he was kind of jacked then, but then he stayed with it all through these years. You know, he's now like 21, 22 years old and it barely takes any effort for him to look as good as he does. And then when he really starts training hard and following his diet and everything, he just kind of, you know, he, he's a, you know, he's five eight, I think at best, and he, he turns into, you know, two hundred and thirty five pounds and shredded. So I just think it helps so much having some type of training, you know, it, during your I guess pubescent times. So I agree. What uh so then you went into high school football? High school football. And what did you and do training there? We actually um we were a really good team, but we didn't have like an actual like gym or anything. I remember it was um now they have a gym and everything. How many kids did you have in your high school? Um my graduating class was only about two hundred. Oh wow, ours was like eight or nine. And I think like a thousand, some maybe twelve hundred kids in the whole school. But we we were a good football team. We were a good program. I choice there to play football. But um we never had a real like strength program. Uh, what the whole the only the only thing we had in the gym was a um, what do you call it? It was like a big universal rep. Like uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's got like a, a bench press. Maybe it has yes. like all these different machines yeah. in a circle. We had a couple benches. Yeah, but um, was it chrome. Any it all chrome? No, it was white. It was white. <laughs> but any um, strength training I did on my own at the YMCA with some buddies, and um, even then. You know, it was like kind of bro lifting. I know what my dad taught me, um, which he had him and his his buddies were pretty big lifters, so they had a good basic understanding of lifting. They taught me how to bench press and everything, but squatting wasn't a thing for me. 
Uh, I always you don't say. <laughs> I always I always went off of uh, Reggie White never squat it, so I don't need to squat because I'm genetically like Reggie White. Yeah, uh, you guys are the same person. Yeah, but um, yeah. So going to the YMCA, you know, messing around. Uh, luckily, I had the pl- I had the privilege the privilege and um to to be surrounded with hardworking athletes. Okay. When I was in high school, so I I pushed myself because they pushed me and. It taught me a lot about, you know, that, about pushing myself. I assume you benched a lot? I did. I benched, uh, when I was 19, I benched 425 pounds. What about frequency? Um, so I remember my junior year of high school, I did a football combine where I did 225 for 14. And then in my senior year, I did 225 for like... Like 16? No, I'm not talking mean, volume. Like, how often oh, were, volume, you, were you going to the gym and benching? Oh, God. Um, probably, like, once or twice. One, like, once a week, I would bench. Maybe twice a week. See, I was doing the same thing. When I started weight training when I was 15. Um, you know, my father had, like, the cheap bench press. You know, the concrete-filled weights yes. on the standard bar. And uh, he wasn't really using them anymore. He started getting into more like cardiovascular activity. Um, so like there wasn't a ton of stuff in that spare room we had. Um, but by like 15, 16, I think I might've been 16. You know, I was benching 255 pounds. And what did you wear? I was 130. Um, but you know, later in life I had a pretty good bench press. You know, I got invited to uh, like bench press worlds or whatever for the IPF. Um, when I was in college and I think it's because I was, you know, training a bench press, training that movement at such a young age. Yeah. Right. Well, it goes with, uh, you know, I, that now when you're young, it, I would, I would imagine that it's better to focus on your technique, right? Or is it just better to just jump in there and start going? Uh, I mean, like, obviously your technique is important, right. and, and, but I would say it's most important in the sense of injury prevention. Right. So I, I think, you know, those early years of lifting, even if you're older and you're just starting out, I think the faster you can learn how to apply intensity, I think the better off you're going to be. Okay. Right. Um, so like at 15 years old, 16 years old, you're probably lifting as hard as you possibly could. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was too. You're I can't, fresh in you. You know how many times I failed under the bar yeah. and I had to dump it? Yeah. You know, and then, you know, the, this spare room was upstairs and so my parents would hear the weights crashing down yes. on us. You know, they thought I died up there. Um, but, I mean, it was almost every single session that weight ended up on my chest. Yeah. Um, I just think it helps, right? It's like, uh, you know, when we lift with, with Brian, you know, he always says, like, every single one of your reps is the exact same and then you rack it. It's like, well, I just know where my limits are. Right, because I've tested it so many times. Mm-hmm. And I feel like a lot of people don't know where their limits are, so they end up hanging up a little early, or they end up super shaky when they start pushing, you know, those limits. Now, what do you say about someone uh, getting into it at an early age and their longevity in it? Uh, so, like, because I see a lot of, I didn't get into, I didn't start powerlifting until about six or seven years ago, really, when I met you. Right. But I see guys that have been in it for like fifteen years. And, um, you know, they're strong, but injuries are a thing. Myself, injuries are a thing. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been able to successfully complete a meet without pain and, you know, right. since before I met you. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it depends on it, on programming, frequency, uh, and then other factors, like life factors and stuff. You know, um, for instance, like... Uh, you know, somebody who drives a dump truck all day, mm-hmm. I, I think is going to be more susceptible to injuries than, you know, somebody who may work in an office. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the, the constant impact. Um, you've been in a dump truck, right, with, for work? Yes. You know, you know how bumpy they are and how yes, stiff yeah. they are. And I just think the wear and tear and the, the tightness um, that your body goes through from something like that can play an effect. And I know it's not even something that people really even talk about, um, but I do think outside life factors, you know, play a big part in that sure yeah but i'm saying like and this is what my brain's kind of just going so i'm just going to spit it out while i think about it but Mm -hmm. so like 
when you're when's your anabolic prime as they call it for for like is it 30 35 oh man so that's a that's an interesting question um i don't think that has anything to do with the amount of time that somebody's training okay so you're because what i was going to say is it bet is it better to burn out some of your best years when you're younger or when you're fully developed when you you know what i mean I think if somebody were to like play out their life, right, like right. schedule their life out, I think if they did more hypertrophy work at, at younger ages mm -hmm. and went into strength training in later ages, I think it would be better okay. uh, because building up all those supporting muscles, like think about how much muscle even you put on doing movements outside the barbell. Mm -hmm. Right. So like how much, you know, we talk about the hamstring curl all the time over there. Yeah. You know, we trained on that for like six months straight. Right. And mm -hmm. you were like, oh, my God, my hamstrings grew an inch. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think somebody going through that uh, and using the machines and learning how to do everything properly, because bodybuilding is really about movement execution. OK. And I think if you can learn that well, then you can easily, uh, you know, put that into some type of strength training program and that would extend your longevity. The issue with going, you know, balls to the wall from the start and being at a young age is you're basically you haven't developed your supporting muscles. You also haven't, uh, you know, reached like peak execution for the movements. Right. So like you end up all over the place, you end up hurting yourself. And I think those injuries can last a long time. So I, I ultimately it can set you back. Okay. Let's talk about that. Uh, that first time we met, do you remember, uh, do you remember? I the, do. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I came into your store. No, 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 not that. What do the, you mean? Uh, the little meat. Which meat, which meat? At the, uh, the warehouse the, gym. Well, that's not the first time we met, though. Oh, yeah, but but that's when I decided to help you out. Okay. I was like, this guy's pitiful. I need, he needs help. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we can... There's... All right, we'll save the first time we met for later. This is the first time you well, saw that, me that's lift. That's too romantic. No. It's... <laughs> Listen. You said we couldn't talk about those things here. <laughs> but, um, no, that so that meet, I came in to the meet, uh, benching 525 pounds, and... Uh, squatting 405 pounds and deadlifting. I think I did some form of that I called sumo. It was not sumo. And uh, that was about 450 pounds. Yeah. So I benched way more than I squatted and deadlifted. And um, I think I still won that meet, though. I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was a, a, lot of comp a lot of stiff competition in there. <laughs> you uh it's not every day that you see somebody bench over 500 pounds right like you know every time you've gone to the gym and bench 500 plus like people stop what they're doing and watch um yes i'm, but, a, I'm a legend in the retro fitness well, you're a levitown legend we're gonna make t-shirts <laughs> um but to have somebody bench that much and squat that little and deadlift that little was just like such a freak thing for me to watch. And I didn't really know you at the time. I was just like, my God, this guy needs serious help. I'm not proud of that <laughs> uh, time in my life. But, um, um, go on. Yeah, right. so I, I know you didn't have much money back then. So I was just like, eh, Still don't have let, much money. Wow. Hey, listen, you got a nice job now. But, um, you know, my goal was to, to just get you on track. Right. And, and kind of what we did is exactly what you just asked me. Right. So like, how do you get somebody, you know, to the end goal over a long period of time? And if you look back at the programs, you know, the, our first few waves of program were strictly frequency. Yes. Right. Yeah. It was like the, yeah. the more you squat, the better you're going to become at it. Yeah. The more you deadlift, the better you're going to get at it. Sure. Now that doesn't last forever. No, I mean, right, right now. Yeah, right now it wouldn't work because your your weights are so high that the frequency would break you down too much. You wouldn't yeah. it, it would be non-recoverable. Um, but implementing that frequency was so important. Uh, one of the programs I ran in college um, was the Advanced Mad Cal Five by Five. Right, everybody. <laughs> I know Mad Cal. The, the Mad Cal uh, Five by Five. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, so most Five by Five programs are twelve week programs. This was okay. a nine week peaking program. I didn't know it was a peaking program. It's just what one of the uh, one of the kids in, in uh, Penn State powerlifting was just like run this program. And at the time, I was squatting um, three fifteen for five and four or five for one. By the time I got done those nine weeks, I was doing five sets of five with four or five. <clears throat> wow! Because I never trained to squat more than once a week, mm -hmm. and that's what frequency did for me, right? 
But that's also why I think it's important for people to always try programs on their own because you can take little bits and pieces of different programs that work. Like, so now I know that frequency, there, there's a point to frequency, right? Okay. But I also knew that at that time, if I ran that five by five again, I might have gotten another five to 10 pounds out of it. Yeah. Right. So, like, something like that doesn't last forever. A good example is those, uh, like, Smolov programs, Smolov and Smolov Jr., you know, where you're, you're training like that. The 10. Small was like ten sets of squats. Yeah, um, I, squat I forget, every day. Is actually, that what that I is? haven't. No, I, I. It's not every day. Um, but they they have like bench, deadlift, or squat, and then they have like a complete program. I actually haven't looked at the templates in years. Um, but it, it's a high frequency program, but it's right. not sustainable, right? So you no. can use something like that for like a peak or you know just to kind of test, just to get yourself to handle more weights. But you can't run something like that forever. But Actually, I think I was looking through the programs the other day. Up until the program that you're on now for this next meet, you've never actually ran a peaking program. All what? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> All the programs that I've given you for the for the most part um, were really just to continually build your base, right? Okay. And the the difference is like a peaking program. Um, I always say like a, an off season program, you get stronger. A peaking program, you get better. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's why we're pulling a lot of the accessory movements. Um, you know, you're seeing lower volume there because we need you to be able to recover. Yes, I love and, low volume. <laughs> Put that down. Note that low volume is terrific. Yeah, it's going to help with your meat and your uh, weight cap too. Well, yeah, losing the weight. Yeah. Um, but we're also working on lower reps now too, right? Yes. So we, we're, what we're trying and to do quality. when we do that is we're, yeah, exactly. We're building quality reps versus, you know, I, if I think five sets of two reps is better than, you know, two sets of five reps because it's going to imitate what you're doing in a meet better yeah. and allow you to practice the simple stuff like walking out the weight, yeah. right? Racking the weight, um, you know, feeling centered, working on your call commands, that kind of stuff. Um, and again, you're just getting better at what you're doing. You're not really getting stronger during that period. Mm -hmm. So... Yes. That's why also whenever I'm training, I try to, like when I bench, I always try to bench with a pulse. When I like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I just, just think, you know, but some things you're just more comfortable with. Yeah. And that's just how you've always done it. So, like, I don't think you intentionally bench with the pulse. I think you just bench with I the pulse. I do now. I because before I started powerlifting, I would like, I would spoto press. That was like my bench. I would stop an inch like before I touched my chest. And then I would go from that. I still think that's harder. Yeah, but at the time, it felt like it was easier f to me because that's all I did. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> I think it's because of my great shoulder mobility. That's what, uh, because I, I would stop a little short. What, uh, but, I mean, obviously, as you like learn more about powerlifting and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, we've never really navigated towards conjugate but you've also never really had any like interest in it what what about that turns you off um you know honestly i you know growing up playing sports and having coaches um i've always done well with so with following the plan and i didn't start powerlifting until i met you and you've always given me i know you don't like to be called a coach but you always wrote programs and I just followed the plan because I didn't I still don't know so much about powerlifting half the times I don't even know what I'm doing I just do what you're telling me right and I follow the plan um I just what was the question again? well <laughs> I, why I we never it. like you know, oh, you never, yeah you never really went towards it um I never needed to I mean I don't know like like I said like you've always had a program that I followed and Every program, the numbers went up, and I'm and why stop a good thing? Um, not that I I, I don't it's, I, it's not that I don't like conjugate or anything. Um, you know, I just never really ne needed to change. Yeah, the I think conjugate training is a team sport. Well, and I, I feel like if you were training with a crew, oh, absolutely, it, it could be a great way to do things. Yeah. I also think enhanced lifters do better with conjugate sure. because, like, when you're, you know, let's just say you have like, you know, X compound as a base, right? And then you throw something else in. Well, you might be a lot stronger that that you know those upcoming weeks, 
So mm-hmm. you can't really use percentage-based training, right? So you kind of have to work in that max effort range. And that max effort may be five reps, four reps, three reps, two reps, one rep. doesn't really matter. Um, but it allows you to work to your potential better, right? Whereas percentage-based training, if you, you know, let's just say, you know, you're, you have a 600-pound raw bench and, you know, you're due to hit, you know, 75% for, you know, six sets of four or something. I mean, an enhanced lifter, once they take their stuff, they might be a little bit stronger than that at that time. Uh, so I just feel like it, it it does cater a little bit better for, for that, but I also feel like you need the atmosphere. I think that's what makes it what it is. Yeah, I would I would love that kind of an atmosphere. I, I um I love watching like, you know, on Instagram and everything and seeing like the certain crews that like they, they squat every Sunday. Yeah. And they're all pushing. It just reminds me of, like I said, in high school, having been surrounded by, like, hardworking people around me. Like, there's a lot of days. I'm a naturally lazy person. That's just how I am. You don't say. I grab it. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm just lazy. But I but I want to win, right? So when I'm around those people that are competing every day, you know, it it, I, so it pushes me. Yeah. Um, That's a funny thing, actually. Like, I'm lazy, but, like, I want to win. <laughs> So yeah. like I mean I guess a little bit of that's like ego, right? When you're sure. in the presence of other oh people. Oh my god. Like, you know. I'm very I I tried not to be, but you know, very ego driven person. You know? Yeah. It I can't not you know, that's why like every time I would live I whenever I'd bench, I would max out every day. I had this pyramid program I used to do before I met you and I would come in and I'd start with 225, 315, 405 and then I'd do 500 or I'd do as close as I could to 500 for a rep or two and then I would do I would come down 405, 315, 225. The only reason I did that is cuz I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that that way I could I could bench the most I possibly could every day. So I'm at the gym, and everyone could be like, oh, look at how much he benches. Look at the tan bear. That's just re- yeah, look what, at the tan bear. What, That's uh, the reality of it. That's why I did it. What would you attribute your going from 525 to 600? Because, I mean, you know, 525 is a big bench, but getting it to that 600 barrier, which I think only, what, like 15 people have done in a full power meet at the 308 weight class? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, um, not a lot of people have done I know, it. I know that the people that can bench press over 600 pounds, I don't think, I think, I mean, and this changes every day. You see it. There's yeah. so many big, but, uh, it's like, I think like 200 people. That but bench but not many people do it in full power. Right. So you did it in a full power meet, which is yeah. a, a bigger thing. If you're bench only or deadlift only, or if you're, um, you know, bench and deadlift, uh, a push pull, that's not powerlifting. No, I never wanted to be yeah. a bench only guy. But what do you think? Would you attribute going from 525 to 600? 600. Okay, well, a lot of things. First, I mean, one, actually getting on a program. You know, having someone that was more knowledgeable than me help me f- frequency and just everything that I didn't know, sticking to a plan. I never stuck to a plan. Like I said, I was ego lifting. Right. I was coming into the gym lifting for to everyone to see me. As, <laughs> as bad as it sounds, but... <laughs> I mean, it's just truth. I mean, it's I'm going to keep right? it true. Yes, she she loves my bench press. <laughs> but, um, you know, following a plan, so there's one. I had structure now. Um, two, you know, when I met you, I was 265 pounds, and you kept telling me I had to, I had to eat. I had to get to 300. And thank you because now I'm stuck here, and I can't lose any weight because it just – I did, my body does not lose weight. But So from getting from 525 to 6 was, one, eating more, getting more weight, gaining more weight um and following a structured plan and um you know i i always look back on that time lifting and it was i don't know if it's because like my body was so like more it was more fresh and like i had the fire inside of me but like in my head i had the mentality that i could do it i believed i could bench 600 pounds and i failed I think I failed 575 a few times. Yeah. I, I think leading into that meet, you actually yeah. failed it. Right. Um, but, like, now, like, like right now, see, I, there's some point in the training and everything, like, I, I come to a point where, like, I don't know. I don't know if it's because, like, I see more, I understand it more. I think back then I didn't really understand powerlifting as much as I do now and I just in my head like I had that like 
uh, that blind faith. Like I knew I could, I knew I could bench 600. I felt it, you know. And um, like now, like I, like I know I can squat 800. I feel I have that same, yeah. But I have the last meet, yeah. But I feel that inside me because I don't want to be a 300 pound power lifter that can't squat over 800. It's embarrassing to me, to me. You know, and that, that's ego too, but it's embarrassing me. I, I mean, don't, I'm embarrassed for you. Yeah, it's embarrassing. I weigh 300 pounds, okay? But, like, seriously, but I know I know I have it in me. That's right. why I got to do another me because I can't – I have it in me. And and having that belief inside of me, that mentality, I want to say, it, it, it helped a lot from getting me from 525 to 600. It's, it's crazy because what you just said is my exact argument for why I don't like coaching. But it's the, also the, the counter argument for why people need coaching, mm-hmm. right? Like, I don't like coaching because it's that simple. You added food and structure. That's food it. You, structure. Food and structure for five years, and you added 75 pounds on your bench press and 375 pounds on your squat and deadlift. I did, yeah. Right? So, like, thank God. But food and structure, it's that yeah, simple. It is. And that's why, like, you know, when, when I got done, you know, competitive powerlifting, that's when like coaching became a thing. Like I, okay. it wasn't even yeah. a thing back in like 2010, 2011. Yeah. Everybody just did their own thing. And even for Penn state, like I was our powerlifting coach. All I did was hand out templates. Like, yeah. listen, I wasn't spending any time on anybody that couldn't squat 300 pounds already. Cause if, if you can't get there on your own, yeah. I can't do anything for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just follow a, st- a standard template, be patient. And if you're consistent, then you'll get to where you need to go. And if you're not consistent, then you didn't waste my time. So, and follow it and stick to it. I think it took, I got, it's been so long ago, but I pretty sure from five twenty five to six took a few years, took a couple of years. Yeah. So five twenty five was 2015, November. Uh, at least that's when that meet was, yeah. and 600 was 2018. 18. Uh, yeah. In August, July. Yeah. July. So that's when you met Jay Cutler in the bathroom. I did meet Jay Cutler in the bathroom. It was an awkward experience, if I may tell that story. You real can tell quick. the story. So, um, me and Jay Cutler is my all-time favorite bodybuilder. He's listen, and I'm mad because. I always knew who Jay Cutler was. He's one of the first guys you see in the magazines when you're a kid. He was everywhere. But I didn't understand how much I liked Jay Cutler because after, after meeting him that one time, I wish I met him after I listened to him on podcasts and everything because I just I respect the man so much. But we go into the old bathroom to uh, go to, to take some um, pre-workout pills. Pre-workout pills if you could call it that. Yeah. And we go in there and, and it's me and a couple of my buddies and uh, we're, I go to, we're standing there and Jay Cutler comes walking in with his, and I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? So I go to the urinal and my, my Alex is in the other urinal. So Jay Cutler, because he's a grown man and he doesn't care, goes right in between us. And I'm standing there and I don't have to pee. So I'm, I'm trying to like judge what's a proper like, What's a good time frame to act like I'm peeing? So I stopped, I flushed the toilet, and I just walk out. Now, I didn't wash my hands. Because you didn't pee. Because I didn't pee. He comes out, and I go, Jay, whatever I said, like, ah, nice to meet you. And I reach my hand out to shake him, shake his hand, and he looks at my hand. And at that moment, I realized I didn't wash my hands, and he knows it. But God bless him, he shook my hand, and he took a picture. And he looks phenomenal, by the way. He always looks good. He looks good. phenomenal. And he's such a good dude. I mean, can I just say that? And I'm sorry. Everybody says he's the uh, the business of bodybuilding. Like, oh my everything God. he does, like, turns to gold. Yeah. Um, but I think as far as, like, physiques go, and I know people argue, like, Ronnie, Dorian, you know, all the, uh, you know Flex, uh, Kevin Laverne. But, like, I don't know, man. There's just, I think Jay Cutler is it. Like, I, I listen. Yeah. I mean, Jay Cutler and Ronnie, growing up, you know, my mom and my dad would go to the gym and we had all the muscle and fitnesses and men's health and, and nice uh, little magazine. Oh, yeah. Holder. Your mom's super fit, too. My mom's pretty I was, shredded. Didn't yeah. She? And yeah, your dad's a monster. Her. So, like. My dad's large. I didn't. I did not get his height. No. <laughs> yes. I got his weight. I got my mom's height. She's like 5'3". I'm not 5'3". But, yeah. I mean. Good. But yeah, so um, we had his magazine rack, uh, and you know I would sit there doing my business, and you know flipping through the old Muscle Fitness, and those are two guys you see. 
Ronnie Coleman and Jay Cutler. That was all I saw back then. That's why I ended up getting uh, the Ronnie Coleman's NO shotgun. You remember that? Yeah. And I got that because it came with a free uh, DVD of Ronnie doing biceps. And I thought, what a deal. And you know what he did? He curled. Yeah. Like, who who would have thought? Amazing. Who who would have thought? I remember seeing a video of him saying he doesn't really train arms, and every other week he hits them. Well, um, listen, that's you know, a whole other story, brother. Because he so much in, in the other movements. Um, but Genetics. My, my first pre-workout experience, because um, I, I didn't drink caffeine until I was 28. Mm-hmm. So my first pre-workout experience was the uh, the Gaspari pre-workout. And I didn't understand caffeine. I was a kid. Like, I didn't really understand how it all worked. I was just like, ah, pre-workout, okay, I'll take it. And uh, I ended up laying down on the bathroom floor of the YMCA because I didn't know what was happening to me. So I was like, I think I'm going to die. So let me go lay down here. And, uh, yeah, just kind of laid there until it wore off. The first pre-workout I ever took was, um, it was, um, can I say it was GNC? Obviously, that's yes. where I first went that's to. That's where we all went. Yeah, it was GNC. It was um, it was a yellow container. Ah, I forget the name of it. It was like Rage or something. Something. Anyway, all I think it's the beta alanine or alanine, whatever you say. It would sit at the bottom. So when you got to the bottom of it, your whole mouth would just be on fire. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it might have been niacin, but it, yeah, yeah, yeah. What that's it, what. It, it, what it, yeah, been. that's what it was. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah, and it was just so bad. And now it's so funny because they all blend up so nice now, and you drink them right down. People don't realize how spoiled they are with supplements. Yeah, these like kids the, don't know. The, the, fla- <laughs> the flavoring is just amazing. I remember uh, when I was in, when I was like 15 and doing my bench presses, I would take a little whey protein shake to school. And, uh, you know, one of my meals, I, you know, I'd be mixing Wait, it up. What? And, did you? Yeah. Because yeah. so, okay. I would steal it from my dad. So I would take the whey protein and the creatine because um, he would buy stuff but never use it. It would just mm-hmm. sit in the cabinet. And then one day it would be empty. And, you know, then he'd be like, oh, did you take my stuff? But um, Someone had to use it. Yeah, I mean, it tasted awful. And honestly, yeah. the G- I, from what I hear, the GNC powders really haven't changed on flavor. But uh, been maybe it's years. nostalgic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean that—that's really all that was worth taking back then. Yeah, protein powder, creatine. Oh my gosh, you want to like, go? Didn't need anything else into when you were a kid. supplements when I was in high school and I was getting into the gym. I thought glutamine was like God. See, when I was—I do like glutamine. Well, when I was—it's just not God. Well, yeah, when I was coming up, we're talking like as a kid, Mark McGuire. You that's know what, what I he mean? took glutamine. Well, go creatine. So, so when I'm getting in the gym. I need that edge. I'm taking creatine and and I'm taking glutamine. And this was my thing. I don't know how I came to this conclusion, but I would take creatine pre-workout and I would take glutamine post-workout. Okay. And um, that was all I took was creatine and glutamine. And I didn't even take pre-workout back then. I mean, probably so hyped up as a kid you didn't need it. My friends got into the, what was it, the 1AD... The first pro hormone. That was it. That was what Mark McGuire Mark was McGuire taking. Was taking. Yeah. They you dabbled it with GNC. it. They dabbled with it. I didn't get the chance. And I tell you what, they got real big in like a month. And then they stopped taking it. Yeah, you had like but, the, the 1AD. I think you had uh, like M1T. That was another yeah. one. Um, Super Draw and spawn did you take spawn well, now spawn came a little after so yeah. this is like when i was get I just graduated high school so that's like all i knew about supplements like that and protein that was it i remember getting the, the glass iso pures at the gold's gym that me and my dad my dad and i would go to they still haven't changed that right they're still no. glass yeah we yeah. still have them yeah. but um that's all i knew about supplements but come to um being the age of 25 i believe is when I was I, I discovered the beautiful pro hormones. I remember. And yes, you do. That's that's actually how we first met. Is <laughs> I came into his store met. and I said, "Listen, what pro hormone can I take year round?" And he's like, "You shouldn't take pro hormones." I said, "What can I take year round?" He's like, "Well, if you're going to take one year round, you probably should take this, or you shouldn't do it, but you, I guess you could try this one out." And I tried it. It worked well. It was. Uh, Super Trend. Was Super the Trend. Name of it was it. Blackstone Labs. It is not like Trend though. It was not. It's not. Trend. No, it was, I think the actual compound. But it was, was actually. It was actually good. Like yeah. it didn't give me back pumps or anything. No, it's progesterone based. It, it didn't have a uh, liver toxicity to it. 
Um, you know, sometimes you, you would have BP issues. Um, yeah. you, again, you could end up with progesterone issues. Um, so it still needed to be managed. But, yeah. I, I, oh, well, I didn't know anything about that, so yeah. who cares? But anyway, uh, when I heard about the spawn stack, was before I came to you, and that's when I started playing around with them. I don't know, I was about 25, so that's when I, I think actually when I just, when I, I sold the Spawn, or uh, the first ones I was getting was the Spawn 2. Yeah, I don't even think I the got same. the Spawn. Yeah, the, yeah. the original Spawn was, I think, a mix of like, you know, what they called Trend, but wasn't Trend, obviously, right. and uh, a form of Epistane, I believe, oh. and I think it was the two of them together, um, but guys were gaining 30 pounds in 30 days. It was. It was. Dude, they worked. Yeah. Pro hormones oh, worked. No, back in the day. Well, you know the thing is, is they weren't really pro hormones. They were designer steroids, which is oh, different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, they they absolutely worked. I, They're I think, phenomenal. You know, everybody in football back then was taking them, and oh, uh, you know the yeah. downside were you know a lot of guys would end up with some form of gynecomastia, and they would end up pissing Coca Cola. Uh, because oh, of the liver toxicity. Yes. So you know about that, don't you? I know a little bit about <laughs> liver toxicity. It's uh, it's happened. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, no, that was a. Uh, so yeah, that was that was pro hormones. <laughs> what uh? Twenty five was when I started them. Let's go back to uh to, to bodybuilding. Like, who excites you in bodybuilding now? Ooh. You know, it was Jay Cutler back then, but who is it now? I love that excites me. Um, well, all us old farts are always like the glory days. I lo- I I tell you what, and I just, I I'm I'm more in the bodybuilding now. Than I've ever been. But Back you're also then, like really into CrossFit too. Like you follow a lot CrossFit. of ass- athletes. I just feel ass- like you're what <laughs> this guy. Yeah, yeah. You're a big fan of the I, athletes. I, I love. <laughs> I I love CrossFit. Um, and I, I do. I follow bodybuilding more than I ever have right now because honestly, with Instagram, I can keep up. Yeah. Back in the day, you, know, you weren't hearing. All you hear from bodybuilding is you get the magazines. You know. I mean, for Which me, is the at same least, faces, you know, for the most part. Yeah, it was Jay Cutler and Ronnie Coleman. I didn't yeah. know anyone else. Yeah. But now it's like, man, I, I see who's up and coming, and you know, you follow these guys. But who excites me right now? I mean, obviously, uh, Nick Walker is ridiculous looking. I mean, he's just massive. But so I enjoy watching him, and I like how he, him and um. Blessing? Blessing are, are trying to... They're making it entertaining. Yeah. They are. They're making it entertaining. You know they're friends. I, like. Yeah, but that's still... I, I appreciate yeah. the effort of it. Um, but, I mean, I, I like, you know... Who, who excites me? I mean, I like all the guys that are popular right now. Obviously, like him, Ian, um, Hunter Labrada. I mean, I saw a picture of him the other day. I, I like, he just looks ridiculous. He does. He has good shape. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, his waist is so small. And from what I hear, when I li- when I look it up and everything, he's a lot bigger than I thought he was in person. I mean, he held his own uh, when he was competing against right. Nick at the Olympia. Yeah. So, I mean, well, that's he's obviously I, a big dude. Well, that's why when, I, when, when, when that happened, I was like, wait. But then everyone's saying, like, oh, you have to see him on stage. But he, he, I, he, he excites me. Um, just cause I, I like seeing it, Like you said, his shape is nice. Um, I, I who think else? like, you know, like, I love Evan Sonapani. Well, Evan, yeah, but he you're my kn- favorite. That's my favorite. You like his cooking builder. shows. I love his cooking shows. Um, go on. I just had to. Put yeah. I mean, there. obviously Evan, I think would be everybody's favorite bodybuilder if oh, he were to mint. compete. Um, but I feel like something always uh, happens, you know, I think he was going to do the New York pro last year and I think they moved it to Tampa. They or moved it. The so. man goes on his own terms though. He does. He does his own. He does what he wants to do. But that's. And I respect it. Yeah. That's why everybody loves him. But, um, yeah, I, I just feel like there's not a lot of guys that emulate that old school bodybuilder, right? Old school. It, How so? Like in that. It's a lot of hard workers right now. No, there are. Yeah. Um, they get it in, and you can see that now because the the Instagram, YouTube, you follow these guys now more than you ever did. Oh, uh, Nathan Diash has got it. You talk about good shape, that guy. Yeah, he's got good shape. Yeah, I, I just think like uh, like Ian always looks like a big bodybuilder, right? So like it doesn't matter what he's wearing, it doesn't matter whether he's off season or in season. Like that dude just looks big all the time. Well, he's got the delts. 
Yeah, but just like the way clothes lay on him, it just reminds That's me. That's what of, I mean. Yeah, yeah it's like just it the lays. way like like how like Marcus Rule and like all them guys yeah. back in the day would look when they wore like a sweatshirt. You know, you you still like if that guy's walking down the alley, you turn around going the other way. You know, and, and he has like that kind of build to me. So like I'm a big fan. I, I think he's he's good for the sport in that aspect. Um, you know, Derek Lunsford, I think mm-hmm. looks crazy. Um, Dude, he's. He looks like an open bodybuilder. Like he looks. Well, massive. he is. They they said he has. He's like having. He has a hard time losing weight. Yeah, I mean, I, he's so lean. He'll be successful in whatever class he decides to go into. Um, but I, I think as far as like shape is concerned, he's probably one of the best, if not the best. Yeah. And then uh, I just love the way like Sean Clarita trains. I can watch his training videos all the time. That guy. Is you were told about he is that's a bubbly man that is he is 3D a hundred percent like it's like you like when he stands alone it's just so impressive when he and then he stands next to someone you're just like okay obviously like he's smaller but like dude his muscles are just like they his muscles have muscles yes like yeah. it's just like it, it really is when you talk about like building something you know because you know I feel like nowadays with uh, drugs and everything. Like anyone can really get huge. Yeah. No, am I wrong? No, I, I think they can. I just think. But how he they look. gets. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. He just like he he's getting muscle, man. Like it's I don't know. I'm, I, I don't even care I don't about that. Gush. I just love the way the guy trains. He trains cool. He's so locked in. He was he was like dumbbell pressing like 170s for 10 the other day. That's he's insane. He's all business. I mean, but so old school. Would Branch Warren be considered old school? I think he was on the cusp, right? Um, I don't know. I was a big fan of him, though, when I was oh. a kid. He was another one. He was in a ton that of magazines. Man scares the shit out of me. He's still massive. I would say yes, sir, to him. No, not even what he looks like. His whole, the way he looks at you. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's all business. What was cool about Sean when we had him on the podcast in an earlier episode, I forget the number, um, he was one of them guys, like, as soon as he walked in, you could just, like, grow out with and level with yeah. like you didn't have to try to be somebody around him like he was just super blue collar normal dude like he's not you love that you know yeah and i think he went on to win the olympia that year i think that was he 2020 did. and then uh because he because when you had him on he just placed third yeah yeah and then he won it yeah, yeah. well he came on our podcast he got good luck and then he won the olympia that's so what you're saying is if you consider yourself or if you're a top level athlete come on the show have a few words with us, and then you you know you're gonna win. What is it that you know? Obviously, you're you're into the the different physiques and training styles and stuff of bodybuilding, um, but like, what is it about CrossFit that intrigues you? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> being being a large, very unathletic man, watching someone do the stuff that they do is like mind blowing to me. Like I watched, I forget, it was a couple years ago, I think. Yeah, because Frazier was still in it. And they ran, I don't know how long. It was like up and down hills. One of the events, they ran probably like, I don't know. It was probably, it was like over 10 miles probably. Like a hike, like through the woods. They had to run this, right? They're all busting their ass to win this race, right? They're going as hard as they can. Can They get to the end and the dude Dave just is like, oh, go back. You're not done. Yeah. Like they just did, like they just put everything they had to get to the end of that. Goes go back, you're not done. Now they got to do it. They have to just pull something out of the tank and do it all over again. Like that shit's fascinating to me. I think it's the it's just it's like when you talk about overall athletics. Like I mean, you talk like powerlifting. You know, it's awesome, but it's like up and down. Weight right. goes up and down. This you're looking at someone. They're running. They're swimming. They're lifting weights. And let me tell you something. Like, I'm, I'm watching the girls deadlift, like, 450. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Brooke Wells deadlifted, like, she was over 400. I remember, I so think I remember watching that. They're, they're spending a whole week of just burning themselves out and still lifting weight like that. It's just impressive to me. Yeah. And I know it gets, like, people, like, I don't know. Some people like to say, like, oh, bad for them, whatever. But, like, you look at the top level people, like, that's not what it is. Well, they might have bad form when they start to break down, right? That's part sure. of it. But I, I think what you're trying to say is like just the, the mental fortitude to, to, to get there, to go that deep, to compete at that high of a level. 
um, is just impressive. But I, I really yeah. thought you were going to say that the appearance of the women is what drew you to CrossFit. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I mean, what, as far as when it comes to, to uh, women, I mean, you know, and this is a thing <clears throat> with like CrossFit is you're seeing like male athletes, but you're not seeing any athlete that you kind of haven't seen before on the football field or the basketball court right they're all top level athletes athletes as well and and with training like they could do crossfit but i've never seen like the women are just so competitive in it like you know what i mean like when you like i don't know why it is well it's i can explain why Okay. It, it, professional sports for women aren't right. aren't as prominent, right? No. So, like men, even athletic men after high school, <clears throat> after college, you know, you'll find them at, on the courts at LA Fitness. You'll find them playing mm-hmm. flag football. You know, they're they're still competing in some form of sport, but there's really not somewhere, you know, for women to to compete at yeah. a high level. So I feel like they kind of filter into CrossFit. Whereas, like you know, guys like yourself, myself, you know, kind of go towards powerlifting. Maybe something we would consider more masculine, less cardio. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're lazy and we have bad habits. Yeah. But, yeah, no, it's – uh. so that is what I first <clears throat> got me. It was actually Annie Thor's daughter. I'm watching because my, my brother at the time, he was doing CrossFit, um, and I they had it on the TV one time, and I'm watching it, and all of a sudden I see this girl ripped. And she's just – I think she's doing handstand push-ups, which is fascinating to me. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like, dude. And I'm just like, wow. Like, I've never seen that before. And then I start following it more because, like I said, I enjoy the competition of it. And, you know, the men, like, you got Frazier. And it was <clears> – <throat> the men, it was like um, – who was Froning? It was Froning and then a few guys. But it was Froning. And then – he leaves and Frazier. It's Frazier. So, and like, look, Frazier was blowing these guys out. Like, there was no one creeping up on him. Right. So, it's awesome to watch greatness, of course. I, I appreciate it. And I'm watching him. But you go over to the women. I mean, they're going back and forth, up and down. I mean, you got, like, there was a lot of competition. You got all the th- all the daughter, daughters from, from uh, Iceland. There's three of them. Uh you got Tia, the Australians. So there's Tia, and then um, the other, uh, Jill, my wife, loves um, Cara, Cara Webb. And, <clears throat> you know, then you got the American women, um, you know, with, with Brooke. And I, there's just so many. And then, like, you'll have to forgive me because I can't remember all the new names that came up this year. But watching it recently, you know, there's, um, there's a bunch of new ones. Like, it's just the competition, man. Yeah, I, I think it's. Maybe I'm rambling. I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I think it's intriguing for women because it provides them an outlet to be the monsters that they are. Right? And they're getting like, paid. No, I, I just mean like like let's say like the local CrossFit. Gym, okay, right. We'll, we'll like your wife did CrossFit for a long time. So a few years. Yeah, pretty. I mean, but what drew her to that? Right. Me. It, <laughs> but I, I I think there's I some type of, of outlet there, right, that allows them to just be their raw selves and try to perform as hard as they can yeah. and kind of let it out, right? Um, Women are fierce competitors. But I think men see CrossFit as, like, going down a level. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, if you were... So, so until that's reversed, I don't think we're going to see a super competitive, you know, men's side of things because we there there would have to be more of, you know, the heavy athletes getting pushed into it. And this is what I said with the money. is Look, it is what it is. Like, men's sports, no secret, they make a lot of money. Yeah. So if you're a good athlete, you're not striving to be a CrossFitter. You're striving to be a football player, a baseball player, signing multi-million dollar contracts, right? right. As, a, as, a, as a boy growing up, that's what – like. I I never was like, oh, man, I can't wait to be a powerlifter. No, I was trying to play football. You know, that's the dream. Women, you know, I mean, they're, they're, what are their – I mean, I don't know. I can't speak but for as a woman, but, like, you have the Olympics. Right. And what basketball. Other, right, right, you have the WMBA, yeah. but, like, what else is there professionally that – There's a lot of things professionally, but that are on the scale of, like, football, baseball. Yeah, there's not as much. Not even close. So then you go to CrossFit. These women are making just as much as the men. Probably more. I think the women in CrossFit with endorsements, and and like you said, who's more marketable? 
I mean, the women look great. Right. Um, you know, they're all with that blonde hair, blue eyes, and you know that's the the the, the thing over there. Um, Listen, women, they they're a good like. What do you want to say, role model for a woman that's striving to be in the fitness? I just think women in fitness are easier to market because <clears> women <throat> like to look at women and men yeah. like to look well, at women. Well, that's you. Yeah. So I, I just think that's what I mean. when it comes to CrossFit, I just think they're more uh, more desirable from a marketing, you know, advertising standpoint. Yeah. But Yes. All right, enough about CrossFit women. Sorry. Uh, you're starting to sweat. I get the rambling about the CrossFit. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So as we start to wrap this up, I'm, I'm curious what you think. Um, you know, your highest total was what? 2036. 2036. Um, and I left ha- I left stuff on the platform you, that day. You left a, a ton on the platform. Um, you know, in your last meet, obviously you had some uh, adversity. Yeah. Um, but – what do you think, if at, from from where you are right now, what is it going to take for you to total twenty two hundred pounds? I think first, right now with me, it's going to be mental. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm worn down. I've been going at it for a few years now. Right now, I'm the strongest I've ever been, but I'm also thirty four, and life's not like. I have a life, right? right? So the balance, like I have a a real job now, you know what I mean? I I have a house, a wife, I have responsibilities. I think you talked about it earlier with like um, jobs, like things that, um, whatever. Yeah, play no effect. Right. Yeah. So you have powerlifting, which is a hobby to me, to me, and I love it very much. But listen, man, you're going in the gym, you're beating yourself up. I mentally battle with how much I want to put into it. Yeah, I mean, but Andy Bolton deadlifted a thousand three. He was the first to break the thousand pound barrier as a as a truck driver, <clears throat> um, and he was a full time truck driver, right? Uh, and then he deadlifted, I think, you know, a thousand eight or something after that. Five years later, after like I don't know, he had a bunch of problems, like health problems. Yeah, you, know, you have Donnie Thompson who squatted. Uh, like 1300 or whatever he squatted at like 46 years old right Mm -hmm. so i'm not i'm not asking you for what excuses you're going to make for not that's what i'm 200 but yeah what what does it take for you to total 2200 right so that's just the point i I like i'm just but that's i'll get to that but i'm just saying like mentally right now i had to make a decision because to do something i have to go all in right to get to bench 600 i had to go all in and i know what it takes to get that goal and I know if I want a 2200 goal, I need to put in that effort. And for a while, like over these past few months, I was balancing that. So mentally, I have to be locked in. Um, diet. Um, and I don't mean, like, <laughs> I mean, um, protein-wise, keeping my protein, obviously, just like I did. For recovery you know, purposes. Right, recovery. Yeah. It's all about how you recover. That's why I have the CPAP. That's why my diet, I take... Um, the zinc and um, magnesium every night, right? That's what. I t- <laughs> yeah, ZMA. yeah, yeah, yeah. The ZMA every night. It's just like these little things that you do for recovery. Um, <clears throat> but to get to 2200 total, total, I, I feel in my heart I'm right there. And what it's going to take is me following the program, like what is what it, the same thing it took before. Follow the structured program. And do the best I can to make sure that everything I do outside of the gym helps me in the gym. So that means diet. That means rest, recovery, right? Yeah. I, I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, just to, to put it on record, I think if you optimize your positions, right? So mm-hmm. we spend this beginning part of your prep optimizing your squat, optimizing your deadlift, right? Because yeah. if... if if your leverages aren't correct, like if your positioning and your bar paths aren't correct, you're just making life a lot harder for yourself, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think if you correct that early on and then you optimize your intensity, right? So you know when to pull the trigger on your intensity. Uh, I think if you do those two things along with the warm ups I have in your program, mm-hmm. um, you know, loosen your adductors to, to stretch your shoulders and relieve a little bit of, of your lat tightness, I think if you do that, I think you total 2,200 pounds. 
I, and I, I think it's really just comes down to those three things. I don't even know if you need to lose weight for this meet because if you plan on doing another one, I don't know if it's something that you should add in as a stressor. You know, for the record, uh, unless you're aiming for an all-time world record or whatever, I'm usually not a fan of somebody cutting weight, right? So yeah. especially like during a meat prep, like if you're going to cut weight, you know, three, four months ago, five months ago was a good time to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, cutting weight going into a meat prep is usually never a great idea. Um, so all things, let's just say everything stays consistent. You know, I think if you optimize those three things, you total 2,200 pounds. Yeah. And then you can worry about dropping the weight for the next meet well, to, to hit that at the 308 so that way you can stay on the record board. Oh. Um, yeah. What I mean by diet is I mean actually the nutrition like nutrition value. Yeah, but right? you've always competed in 308, and I think you expect to compete in 308 again. I do. I, I just uh, – I don't think it's something that should be stressed. I, if you're strong now at 325 – you know, you should hang here. And if your weight drops, it drops. Like, if you're within, you know, 6 to... I'm, like, 315 right now. 315, okay. 320. So you're within and this range. this is the thing is, like, what I mean by diet is if I just stop the bull crap, I'll naturally drop down to 308 anyway. The, right now, like, come on, man. Right. Like, I'm, like, I come here, I hit the Arby's. You know, I like the Arby's. It's the seven the cow tails. The McDonald's day. chicken sandwich, can I just say? I told you the about record, that. No, did you? Dude, I'm going to... No, you told me about the McChicken. No, no, Listen, the spicy chicken sandwich. Let me just say, the, okay, the spicy chicken sandwich. The McDonald's, they stole the recipe from Chick-fil-A, and it's delicious. They put it on their buns, which they toast real nicely, and it's just a treat. And get, let me tell you something. You can find a McDonald's on every corner. Chick-fil-A's, you can't find them like that. You know, I didn't realize how much food you could eat until we barely knew each other, but we went up to that meat in Allentown, mm. and you made me go to an Arby's. And you oh. ordered like off menu items. At the oh, Arby's. the the meat mountain, the meat mountain. Yeah. Like, if you go to Arby's, shit. they this don't guy have really it. Is this fat. Yeah, they don't have it on the menu. But if you go to the Arby's, you ask them for the meat mountain. I like they a little sandwich. You. you have like a tray of food. Yeah, it's delicious. It's a it's a chicken cutlet, and then it's roast beef, ham, turkey. I think they throw bacon on there too, all on one sandwich. It's delicious. Meat mountain. Remember that. <laughs> What's uh if people want to follow you, what's a good place to find you? Instagram? Yeah, that's pretty much all I do. I don't really get on Facebook what, like what's that. your handle now? Prosciutto Poppy. Prosciutto Poppy, how clever. Pr prosciutto underscore poppy. I'm like the Drake of Deli Meats. Yes. <laughs> Go on. Guys, thanks for watching. Uh, Ryan and I will be uh, interviewing more people, uh, you know, as time goes on. And uh, Ryan's going to bring kind of a different approach to our podcast here. So please hit like and subscribe and uh, give us a follow. Thank you.